Hello friends, Ms. Mishki back again with another video and it's a brand new month. November is Native American Heritage Month and on this channel we're going to be celebrating all month long, celebrating my favorite way which is through books. So first let me tell you a little bit about what Native American Heritage Month is. Way back in 1976, Jerry C. Elliott High Eagle introduced some pretty groundbreaking legislation to ask for a a week to celebrate Native American history and heritage. Then in 1986, Ronald Reagan actually did proclaim a week in November as American Indian Week. Then in 1990, George H.W. Bush uh, proclaimed that there was going to be a whole month and it was called um, American Indian Month. Sometimes you'll hear it called American Indian Heritage Month. It goes by a lot of names, but um, Native American Heritage Month is what we're going to say on this channel. Here are some quick do's and don'ts for celebrating. Please don't dress up as Indians and pilgrims and recreate the first Thanksgiving. That's culturally appropriative and not what we want to be seeing. Also, please try not to decenter Native voices. This means that you want to make sure that when you are reading books and um, spending money on resources to learn about Native American heritage, you are getting them from the source, from those authors, from those people. That brings me to the do's. Do read books like the one that we're gonna be reading here. Um, do respect the belief systems. Native American culture is alive and well. In this day and age, this isn't something that just exists in history, though we're gonna talk about a lot of history. Um, and uh, keep an open mind. So. What I want to do is share this amazing book with you. Uh, this is called Native Americans in History by Jimmy Beeson. And uh, he's an amazing author. I'm just gonna read you a little bit about him. He's a member of the Osage Nation of Oklahoma. He's from the Eagle Clan. And he has a bachelor's degree in indigenous and American Indian studies from Haskell Indian Nations University. He earned his master's degree in social work from the University of Kansas and he writes nonfiction, fiction, poetry, and essays about contemporary Native issues. Contemporary means the issues that Native Americans are facing right now. But he also wrote this beautiful book about Native Americans in history, a history book for kids. It's a must have for your library. I'll share a few stories with you over the next few weeks. Today, we are gonna be talking about Jim Thorpe. He is from the Sauk and Fox tribes. Jim Thorpe has been described as the world's greatest athlete, and for good reason. He won gold medals in the pentathlon and decathlon in the 1912 Olympics while wearing shoes he found in a garbage can. Along with playing professional football and baseball, he was exceptional in other sports too. Jim was born in, in 1888 near Prague, Oklahoma to Hiram and Charlotte Thorpe. His father was Sock and Fox and half Irish, and his mother was citizen Ban, Potawatomi, and French. When he was still a baby, he was named Watohuk, which means bright path. In the Sock and Fox language, he was a member of the Sock and Fox tribal nation. He grew up with his brothers and sisters on his father's farm, where he learned to hunt, shoot, ride, and tame horses and trap wild game. He had a twin brother named Charles, who unfortunately passed away from pneumonia when they were eight. His childhood was also disrupted when he was sent away to an Indian boarding school near Tecumseh, Oklahoma. The children there were forced to live with strangers who were usually hostile to native culture. Jim ran away many times. He briefly attended the Haskell Institute in Lawrence, Kansas, then went to a public school after his mother's death in 1902. Jim's father died from blood poisoning after Jim moved to Pennsylvania to attend the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. With his parents gone, Jim did not return to Oklahoma. He attended Carlisle on and off from 1904 to 1913. As a teenager, nearing his 20s, he moved around and worked a lot. Originally an army barracks, Carlisle was turned into the first Indian boarding school under Captain Richard Henry Pratt. For three years, Jim lived and worked with white families as part of Carlisle's outing program. Instead of preparing Native youth to assimilate into U.S. society, as Pratt had boasted, the program actually turned the children into a cheap source of labor. Carlisle is where Jim began to make a name for himself as a superb athlete. Shortly after leaving class one day, he jumped over a five foot nine high bar on the athletic field. 
Amazingly, he accomplished this feat wearing his overalls. Legendary coach Glenn Pop Warner saw this and informed Jim that he had just broken the school record for the high jump. Under Warner's guidance, Jim played 11 different sports for Carlisle. He especially excelled at football. Carlisle competed against nearby teams, such as Harvard. In one game, Carlisle played against future US President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Newspapers praised Jim's athletic ability, calling him uncatchable. In 1911, Coach Warner encouraged Jim to participate in the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden. Warner had been coaching him in track and field. His performance in Sweden is the legacy of his athletic career. Jim participated in the decathlon and pentathlon, which consisted of the javelin throw, disc throw, high jump, pole vault, and the 200 and 1500 meter races, among others. He won the gold medal while wearing mismatched shoes he found in the trash after his were stolen. His record of four minutes and 40.2 seconds in the 1500 meter run was not beaten until 1972. His record of 8,412 points in the decathlon was not broken for another 15 years. He won gold medals for the decathlon and pentathlon. Sweden's King Gustav V called him the greatest athlete in the world, to which Jim replied, Thanks, King. A year later, the Olympic Committee stripped Jim of his gold medals when they found out that he had played professional baseball between 1909 and 1910 in South Carolina. He said he hadn't been aware of the restrictions and didn't put up much of a fight over the decision. After graduating from Carlisle in 1913, he married Ivan Miller and they had three daughters and one son together. Between 1913 and 1919, he played professional baseball with the New York Giants, Boston Braves, and Cincinnati Reds. In 1920, Jim co-founded and became president of the American Professional Football Association, which would later become the National Football League, the NFL. Jim got remarried to Frieda Kirkpatrick in 1926, and they had four sons. After retiring from football in 1929, he moved to Hollywood. MGM brought the rights to his story, but they never made the film. He moved back to Oklahoma in 1937 and got involved in Native Issues, touring to give lectures on sports and Native culture. In 1945, he remarried for the third and final time to Patricia Askew. In 1951, Jim's life story was made into a film starring Burt Lancaster. Jim served as a technical advisor. He was paid generously for his contribution. When a poll was taken in 1950, 400 sports writers echoed the sentiments of King Gustav and named Jim the greatest male athlete of the first half of the 20th century. In 1963, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But toward the end of his life, Jim struggled to make money to care for his children and worked various jobs. He was a stuntman in films, dug trenches, worked in construction, and was a security guard. In 1951, he developed lip cancer. He never fought to get his gold medals reinstated, although he was famous and tried to make a living off that fame. He never liked the attention. Then, in 1953, at the age of 65, Jim passed away in Lomita, California. Despite his death, his legacy persists, and although the International Olympic Committee reinstated his gold medals, pr providing his family with replicas in 1982, his 1912 Olympic record is still kept off the books. Regardless of what the Olympic Committee has to say about his official performance, there is still little doubt that generations of sports enthusiasts still view him as the greatest athlete that ever lived. So Jim shrugged it off when his Olympic medals were taken away. Do you think he did the right thing? Would you have done the same thing? He's a very interesting character in history. And absolutely, if you wanna learn more about him, you can see some more photos and famous quotes from him at cmgww.com slash sports slash Thorpe. Thank you for joining me in reading a little bit from this book, Native Americans in History, a history book for kids. I will be back next week with another amazing person from this book and some more awesome resources about celebrating Native American Heritage Month. Have a great day. Bye.